the Cold War. For nearly 50 years, the entire globe was caught up in this tense standoff between countries, politics, and ideologies. The conflict dominated American foreign policy, military strategy, and the everyday lives of ordinary Americans. But how did this competition of ideas become such a threat to the world? In the first four episodes of this six-part series on the Cold War, we've investigated several of the facets of the conflict that pitted the United States and the Soviet Union against each other in pursuit of global dominance. Ahead of our fifth episode, I thought it'd be a good idea to pause for a moment and review what we've learned. The roots of the Cold War began, most historians claim, at the seaside resort town of Yalta in early February 1945. There, the three leaders of the Grand Alliance, Winston Churchill, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and Joseph Stalin, met to decide the fate of Germany and Europe's post-war reorganization. In this conference, Churchill and Roosevelt conceded to allow Stalin a sphere of influence in Eastern Europe, but in exchange, Stalin made assurances that all previously occupied countries would enjoy free elections, democratic governments, and the right of all peoples to choose the form of government under which they will live. This is not what happened, and soon communist governments were installed in Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Romania, Bulgaria, Albania, and then even Eastern Germany. Watching these puppet governments take root across Eastern Europe, Roosevelt despaired. We must come clearly to realize that the Soviet program is the establishment of totalitarianism, ending personal liberty and democracy as we know it. And so the Cold War began. Stalin broke his promises, seeking a global communist totalitarianism that the Americans were morally compelled to confront all across the globe. Or was that really it? No. The Cold War sprung not just from the social or economic or political differences between the United States and the Soviet Union, but from their ideological differences. As we've come to understand through the work of historians studying the conflict, it was the adamant beliefs of both the Soviets and the Americans that communism and capitalism were wholly incompatible, and that the very existence of one entailed the inevitable destruction of the other. The consequences of these intractable ideologies were profound. In the Soviet Union, the social and political oppression of individuals meant nothing if they served the good of the people. Democracy wasn't so valuable if a mistaken majority could elect something other than communism. Starvation and economic degradation were okay because they were merely consequences of the shift to a grander, planned economy. All of this was temporary and necessary because the revolution was the inevitable direction of human development. For the Americans, the fight against communism forced a utilitarian view of their actions, too. As early as 1947, only two years after the end of the Second World War and the alliance with the Soviets, President Harry Truman signed an executive order that required a loyalty check for every federal employee. Everyone who worked for the government, from diplomats to janitors, had to pass a security investigation. If you'd ever been involved with one of the hundreds of left-leaning progressive groups in the United States throughout the 30s and 40s, even tangentially, you were in trouble. The Attorney General drew up a list of several dozen supposedly subversive organizations, and any involvement with even one of them was enough to get you blacklisted, and not only in government, but also in Hollywood, in academia, even certain unions. But what were the authorities looking for exactly? Was communism illegal? Can you outlaw a political party? The short answer is yes. In 1948, the Truman administration charged the leaders of the American Communist Party of violating the Smith Act. The Smith Act made it illegal to teach and advocate the overthrow and destruction of the government of the United States by force and violence. You see, Marxist doctrine suggested that a proletarian uprising was inevitable and that the Communist Party welcomed that revolution. So therefore, in the logic of 1948, American communists were guilty of advocating the overthrow of the U.S. government. The witch hunts of the early Cold War years, especially the wrong-headed crusade of McCarthyism, ruined the lives and careers of hundreds of Americans and frightened or intimidated thousands more. But was U.S. suspicion of the Soviets unjustified? On February 3, 1950, British authorities arrested Klaus Fuchs on charges of atomic espionage. At the time of his arrest, Fuchs was working at Harwell, the British nuclear research facility. Our American scientists would have known him as Carl Fuchs, a brilliant physicist who had lived and worked at Los Alamos from 44 to 46. Fuchs knew everything there was to know about the atomic bomb. He attended the Trinity Test in Alamogordo in 1945. 
And what was worse, he knew almost as much about the Americans' plans to build a hydrogen bomb. So much so that he held a patent for one of the possible designs. And now he had confessed to being a Soviet spy. Fuchs was the first atom spy, but he wouldn't be the last. In 1951, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were tried for passing nuclear secrets to the Soviets. But unlike Fuchs, the Rosenbergs never confessed. Their case became a cause slab for people who assumed the couple had been framed. Their execution in 1953 made them martyrs for McCarthyism. But in 1995, results of a super-secret intelligence operation called the Venona Project were released to the public. These papers clearly showed the Rosenbergs' role in actively spying for the Soviet Union. They were most definitely guilty. And so, with documented evidence of Soviet espionage, the United States took measures against their enemy and their enemy's ideology. Communists and communist sympathizers were dangerous to national security and the American way of life. It's an unfortunate byproduct of this zealous defense of American values that some of those same values, freedom of speech, assembly, and the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness were infringed upon. The Soviets weren't just spying on America, and they weren't just confronting the United States in global political and military theaters. They were also fighting an ideological war all over the world, using the tools of propaganda they had so keenly developed in the 30s. The Soviets were very, very good at propaganda, so much so that the Americans began to wonder if they could learn from them. And so, beginning in 1948, the leading lights of American foreign policy, from the State Department to the newly created CIA, embraced propaganda and covert operations as major tools in the fight against communism. Now, we don't usually associate propaganda and psychological warfare with democracies. These are fairly loaded terms, so let's be clear what we mean. Propaganda is any technique or action that attempts to influence the emotions, attitudes, or behavior of a group. The purpose of propaganda, then, is merely to persuade. Of course, propaganda's bad reputation comes from its lack of transparency. Even if propaganda is true, it's not neutral. And quite often, the authors of propaganda attempt to hide their role or even misattribute the source. So the U.S. government has a funny relationship with propaganda. On the one hand, politicians urge media outlets to push the government line. Truman spoke publicly about the need for propaganda, urging newspaper editors in a speech to them in April 1950 to meet false propaganda with truth all around the globe. Everywhere that the propaganda of the communist totalitarianism is spread, we must meet it and overcome it with honest information about freedom and democracy. Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy didn't rely solely on the American free press. The CIA was formed in 47 as an intelligence agency, but just one year later, the National Security Council was calling for covert action against the USSR. Most of these actions were propaganda campaigns, including a successful effort to sway an election in Italy by having Italian-Americans write impassioned letters back home to warn of the consequences of voting for the communists. And America met Soviet messages overseas, too, with a unique brand of propaganda, jazz. The world was in love with America's music, and so the United States Information Agency, the USIA, sponsored hundreds of concerts overseas in European, Middle Eastern, and Asian cities. These bands were not only popular, but they were integrated, with black and white musicians playing right alongside each other. In a time when the news from Little Rock, Arkansas, showed America to be struggling to provide true equality to all its citizens, the State Department sent out these jazz ambassadors to offer a vision of America as it could be, rather than how it was. Dizzy Gillespie, Dave Brubeck, Louis Armstrong, and Duke Ellington toured the world with their integrated jazz bands. In Thailand, Benny Goodman's band jammed with the King, an American ally who was himself an accomplished jazz saxophonist. Every night, tens of millions of listeners around the globe tuned in to hear Music USA, an hour-long jazz show on Voice of America that stayed on the air for more than 30 years. But most Americans never saw the thousands of newsreels and feature films produced by the USIA. They never heard the jazz programs broadcast over Voice of America. That's because the law establishing the USIA barred it from broadcasting propaganda to domestic audiences. The architects of Cold War foreign policy considered this truthful propaganda so dangerous that they didn't want the country's own citizens to see it. The United States also met the Soviets by fighting proxy wars. In Albania, the CIA parachuted in resistance fighters, 
in Iran, they funded a coup d'etat. The next year, in 1954, they did it again in Guatemala. By the time the war in Korea ground down to a stalemate and an uneasy armistice at the end of 1954, America was already spending millions on propaganda campaigns in Vietnam and placing aircraft carriers in the Gulf of Tonkin. To American strategists, all of these conflicts were mere stand-ins for the larger battle that couldn't be fought. In the early 1950s, the U.S. National Security Council endorsed a document that would shape the course of U.S. strategy for the rest of the Cold War. It was called NSC-68 and envisioned the Cold War as a clash of civilizations, a battle between slavery and freedom. In this kind of war, a victory by force would be hollow. For a victory over communism to be truly meaningful, the citizens of the world must choose freedom. So hear the conviction, the sense of moral fortitude expressed in this document when talking about communism. No other value system is so wholly irreconcilable with ours, so implacable in its purpose to destroy ours, so capable of turning to its own uses the most dangerous and divisive trends in our own society. The Cold War was a real war in which the survival of the free world is at stake. NSC 68 also acknowledged that a war with the Soviet Union was basically unwinnable. Both countries already had atomic weapons, and each was committed to building hydrogen bombs that could kill tens of millions of people at once. So let's talk about nuclear weapons. By 1945, World War II had become a total war, with Germany, Japan, and the United States targeting major population centers. In February, Allied firebombs rained down on Dresden, Germany, completely leveling the city. And U.S. forces firebombed Tokyo. Half the city was destroyed. 100,000 civilians perished. In this context, most military planners saw nuclear weapons as larger, more expensive firebombs. The most notable thing about an atomic bomb, from their perspective, was efficiency. You could inflict an enormous amount of damage from a single plane. But then came the hydrogen bomb. Bomb yields are measured by the amount of dynamite needed to make the same size explosion. The fission bombs the United States used in Japan had a yield equivalent to 16 and 20 kilotons of dynamite. That's 16,000 and 20,000 tons of dynamite. Scientists predicted that a single hydrogen bomb would be at least 100 times bigger, 1.5 megatons. That's one and a half million tons of dynamite. And maybe, just maybe, one bomb could be as big as 15 megatons. Even military leaders at the time understood that there is no military use for a bomb this big. In 1949, a group of scientists charged with evaluating the program recommended against it. They warned that a hydrogen bomb could only be used to slaughter innocent civilians. But by then, the Soviet Union had an atomic bomb of its own. Intelligence authorities also suspected that Soviet spies might know about the H-bomb, too. In that context, President Truman decided the United States would build a hydrogen bomb and the arms race was underway. The United States tested its first thermonuclear device in November 1952, showing that the theorists were right. Hydrogen bombs were enormous. Ivy Mike's yield came in at about 10 megatons. It vaporized an entire Pacific island. The following year, the Soviets detonated their own hydrogen bomb. The yield was smaller, on the order of 400 kilotons, but so was the bomb itself. This was a deliverable weapon. And then, when the Soviet Union successfully launched the first artificial satellite, Sputnik, in October 1957, it demonstrated the Soviets' ability to successfully launch and control an ICBM. This is why the nuclear arms race and the space race went hand in hand. A rocket is a rocket. Put a capsule on top and you're going to the moon. Put a warhead on top and you're fighting World War III. One of the largest consequences of both the arms race and the space race was a new alignment of universities, industry, and the military. By the late 1950s, defense funding dominated several scientific fields, including physics, electronics, aeronautics, and material science. According to the historian Stuart Leslie, about 80% of the federal R&D budget in the 1950s came directly from the Department of Defense. Some of this money went to universities like MIT and some went to the military's own in-house labs, but the bulk of it went to defense contractors like Lockheed, RCA, General Electric, and Westinghouse. Leslie's research suggests that the DOD sponsored a third of all industrial research in the 1950s, 
with the numbers as high as 75% in electronics. As the 1950s wore on, the lines dividing academic, military, and industrial research became more and more blurred. Campuses like MIT and Johns Hopkins housed weapons development projects. An Air Force think tank, the RAND Corporation, developed the field of theoretical economics. This alignment was a departure from American norms. During the Cold War, American politicians opposed any kind of centralized planning, even in scientific research. Government-led planning was part and parcel of communism, so the United States government would not do it in science or anything else. But by the mid-50s, the research economy was being shaped more by military needs than anything else. The military was investing so heavily in certain industries, like aeronautics and electronics, that private companies were shaping their entire research programs to build weapons. It was a development startling enough that President Eisenhower warned against it in his famous farewell speech. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. At the same time, the United States was drilling its citizens in duck-and-cover exercises and building huge underground bomb shelters, big enough to house a government sufficient to keep the country running in the event of a nuclear strike on Washington, D.C. These preparations were made to preserve continuity of government, a crucial aspect of the nuclear strategic theory of the time, mutually assured destruction, or MAD. MAD assumed that war could be avoided by guaranteeing the destruction of both parties in any nuclear conflict. If there were enough weapons and a decision-making government that could survive a first strike, then there would never be an advantage to being the first to use nuclear weapons. You would perish, just as surely as the nation you attacked. But MAD had a zero tolerance for error. The consequences of pushing the button were so severe, so globally catastrophic, that any mistake, any misunderstanding, was impossible to contemplate. But mistakes did happen. When a B-52 armed with two Mark 39 hydrogen bombs fell out of the sky over North Carolina in 1961, we were lucky. The Air Force knew what was happening. The plane had a fuel leak, had radioed in, and crashed before it could return to base. Neither bomb on that plane detonated, but one came awfully close. Documents declassified in 2013 showed that three of the four safeties failed in the intact bomb. Had the bomb fired, it would have likely have killed more than 40,000 people. Most of eastern North Carolina would have been showered in radioactive fallout. And this would have been the best case scenario because the military would have known it was an accident and not a Soviet attack. On January 21st, 1968, a B-52 cruising above a critical strategic air command base in Tula, Greenland, crashed. In an attempt to stay comfortable in the relentlessly dull flight, a pilot had stuffed extra cushions under his seat. The cushion and then the plane caught fire. They crashed four miles short of the runway. Remarkably, six of the seven crew members survived. Once again, the pilots had been in touch with the airfield, and once again, the bombs did not detonate. But the explosives surrounding the bomb cores did. When the base commander saw the giant fireball out on the ice, they knew what was happening. It was an accident, not a Soviet attack. But what if the plane had crashed closer to the base? What if the pilots had not been able to make contact? As it was, the base did not notify the Strategic Air Command about a potential problem until after the plane had crashed. If the base had suddenly gone quiet, and sketchy reports of a nuclear fireball above Greenland came pouring in, how would U.S. military leaders react? Was it a Soviet first strike? They would have had only minutes to decide. At the worst moments of the Cold War, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, the theory of mutually assured destruction worked. Faced with the choice of destroying everything or backing down, both Kennedy and Khrushchev relented. But given what we know now of the more 1,000 significant incidents and accidents involving nuclear weapons between 1950 and 1968, it is utterly remarkable that humanity survived the Cold War. But many people did not survive the nuclear contest of the Cold War. Despite attempts to find hope and progress in the atomic age, the testing of nuclear weapons the world over produced significant and dangerous fallout. Kodak was one of the first institutions to discover the extent of radioactive fallout due to nuclear weapons testing. In the fall of 1945, several runs of X-ray film developed spots. Kodak eventually traced the problem to the packaging of the film. It somehow contained a radioactive element not found anywhere in nature. In late 1951, the radiation problem became more acute for Kodak when it was discovered that the film itself 
was contaminated, even though it was produced in Rochester, New York, 2,000 miles away from the Nevada test site. On March 1, 1954, the United States began another series of nuclear tests in the Pacific. The 15-megaton hydrogen bomb used in the Castle Bravo test was the largest weapon the United States ever detonated and the fifth largest in human history. The fireball was visible from 250 miles away. Radioactive fallout fell over a 3,000 square mile area, well beyond what the test designers anticipated. Hundreds of sailors, weather researchers, and Marshall Islanders were exposed to radiation. A Japanese fishing boat was operating about 80 miles east when the blast went off. The boat was well outside of the test exclusion area, but a fine, flaky white dust started falling on the boat and fell for three hours. Everything and every one on board was soon coated in a thin layer of pulverized coral spiked with radioisotopes. By the time they arrived back in Japan, the entire crew was sick. They suffered burns, nausea, and headaches, and their hair fell out. The fishing boat's radio operator died of radiation poisoning. Their exposure ignited an international scandal. Was radioactive fallout more dangerous than the Atomic Energy Commission had been letting on? To find out, a civilian committee for nuclear information announced plans for a baby tooth survey in December 1958. Baby teeth, according to the press release announcing the study, were an irreplaceable source of scientific information about the absorption of strontium-90 in the human body. And because strontium-90 only comes from nuclear explosions, the activists hoped to use it as an index to Americans' exposure to fallout. Within months, the Baby Tooth Survey had collected thousands of teeth and questionnaires from St. Louis and beyond. By the time the study ended in 1968, it examined well over 200,000 teeth. This wasn't a study headed by radicals or eggheads. It was a study run by housewives and pediatricians, and the results were striking. An early study published in November 1961 showed that the levels of strontium-90 in baby teeth tripled between 1951 and 1955. Children fed formula diets had higher levels of strontium than children who were breastfed, which tied the levels directly to fallout ingested through dairy milk. Increasing public outcry and international tensions led representatives from the United States, the United Kingdom, and the Soviet Union to sign the Limited Test Ban Treaty on August 5, 1963. The treaty would prohibit explosions in water, air, and outer space, solving the problem of fallout. Kodak's film and children's teeth would be safe, but the treaty did not quite solve the problem of nuclear weapons. Because it only applied to the countries that signed it, it didn't prevent other countries from acquiring nuclear weapons. And the existing nuclear powers could keep the weapons they have. They could even develop new and more powerful ones. All they had to do was figure out how to test them underground. And America tried. Project Plowshare was an attempt to find productive uses for nuclear weapons. The program sought to extract and store natural gas, help build highways and shipping channels, or even blow open a new harbor in Alaska using nuclear explosions. From today's perspective, it's hard to take any of this seriously, but by 1963, Project Plowshare accounted for about a third of the AEC spending on weapons programs, as much as $1 million a month on plans for nuclear earth movement. The weapon scientists were technological optimists. The first half of the Cold War was an optimistic time when scientists, engineers, and doctors embraced the idea that science and technology could get us out of any crisis. Science had won World War II, and so far, despite a few close calls, it had held off the communists too. Anything seemed possible. Yet by the early 1960s, this technological optimism was increasingly out of step with the American public. Particularly after the results of the Baby 2 survey were published, plowshare proposals met public resistance. Concerns about fallout had sparked a new environmental movement. Civil rights leaders asked hard questions about whether the country's investment in weapons research was distracting it from solving problems at home. Yet, the U.S. government had one last scientific and technological trick up its sleeve. On July 20, 1969, NASA would put a man on the moon. We'll tell that chapter of the Cold War on the next episode of American History Tellers. If you're new to American History Tellers, welcome. Go back and check out episodes one through four of The Cold War for the rest of this story. You can subscribe to American History Tellers on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this right now. Thanks for listening. We'll pick back up in episode five.